On behalf of the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled, I Wish They Knew We Existed, The Academic Experiences of Latinx College Students in Mixed Status Families, being presented by Dr. Amy Nunez. My name is Kayla, and I'll be assisting as needed during the session. Before we begin, I would like to provide some general housekeeping information. Please spend a moment to ensure that you have a clean connection. After the presentation by our esteemed presenter, we will enter a period of participation Q&A. We ask that you please submit your questions to the Q&A box on Zoom, and please feel free to engage with both the presenters and attendees by using the chat function throughout the webinar. Finally, this is a live webinar and is being recorded. Also, I'd like you to note that all participants are muted. Thank you to each of you for attending. Now I will turn the session over to Dr. Nunez. Thank you so much, Kayla. Um, first of all, I do want to say thank you so much to everyone who is attending. Um, I hope that we get to connect uh, after the presentation. Would love to hear from some of you. Um, I am also want to make sure that I take time to um, say thank you so much to Ahi for recognizing my dissertation as a third place winner in the Outstanding Dissertation uh, Competition. I poured so much love and um, so many tears <laughs> into this dissertation. And I think the biggest, most important part of this was making sure that I um, gave justice to the stories that were shared. And I think, you know, having been recognized uh, makes me feel like maybe I did that a little bit. So um, thank you so much to Ahi and ETS for that. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and get started with um, my presentation. So I'm going to share. And so, as Kayla noted, my dissertation is titled, I Wish They Knew We Existed, The Academic Experiences of Latinx College Students in Mixed Status Families. And before we get started, I do want to do a land acknowledgement. So um, I want to acknowledge the land that I am on today as we come together to learn from each other. As I present today, I am residing on the traditional lands of the first people of the Yakima Valley, the 14 confederated tribes and bands of the Yakima Nation. I want to acknowledge that this land has a deep rooted history of colonization and genocide. As an educator, I want to emphasize that indigenous history, knowledge and power belong in our schools today and always. Um, this was a reflection point that I kept coming back to as I worked on my dissertation. Um, and I think it's important to note that from the very beginning of when this concept of US citizenship began, um, it was granted in the 1700s, US citizenship was granted to free white men of good moral character. And so from the very beginning, we see that this system of US citizenship is flawed, right? Because of that history of colonization and genocide. And so this is a point that I make at the very beginning of my dissertation and that I think is important to make. Um, here as well with you all and okay um with that let's move forward with some of the terms that i used uh throughout my dissertation so i do you use throughout my dissertation the term latinx and so um latina latino is a very big umbrella term right to refer to um, people who are descendants of Latin America, um, including 20 Spanish-speaking countries located in South and Central America and the Caribbean, and who share a history of being colonized by Spain. Um, recently, the term Latinx or Latine has been used um, as an inclusive, gender-neutral alternative. And so this is the term that I um, decided to use in my dissertation because I really strongly believe that our words hold a lot of power. And... Um, that being said, it's important to make sure that we are being as inclusive as possible, right? Um, and so that was why I decided to ch choose the term Latinx. Uh, when I do refer to specific folks who participated in the study, if they identified as Latina or Latino, um, I do refer to them in the way that they were, that they identified. Um, so that's important to know as well. And then uh, as far as a mixed status family, definition. Um, this is going to refer to any um, household where there's a combination of different legal immigration statuses present. So that can include um, a family where maybe usually it includes a family where there are undocumented parents and they have U.S. citizen children, um, but it can include any other 
immigration statuses such as DACA, U.S. residency, um, asylum, uh, and, and so forth. So just anywhere where you see different legal statuses in, in the same household, that's going to be a mixed status family. Okay. And so the purpose of my dissertation was really to see what are the academic experiences of students in mixed status families. I will note that for my study, I focused specifically on US citizen children who have undocumented parents. Um, I did interview several students as well who, um, they were US citizen children who had parents who were US residents. Um, but they got to see, all of these students got to see that transition from their parents being undocumented to then being U.S. residency. So I'll share some of those stories later, but really, again, wanted to see what are the schooling experiences of these children in K through 12, but particularly in higher education institutions. And then um, also something that was really important to me as someone that got my PhD in education policy was to think about what kind of policies we can implement or advocate for to support the educational aspirations of students in mixed status families. Uh, for the contributions of this study, I would say there were definitely um, some contributions made in the field of education and also in the field of Latinx studies. Uh, so in the field of education, there, I would say the big, one of the biggest contributions was thinking about the concept of multi-generational punishment, which I'll talk a little bit more in a second, but um, this is one area where we think about how parents who are undocumented, oftentimes when we think about US laws, they are trying to punish people who are undocumented in, in the country. And um, so parents who have children who are U.S. citizens, oftentimes, um, you know, those U.S. citizen children are also punished by U.S. law, um, even though it's not meant to punish U.S. citizens, right? And so this is the idea that it causes multi-generational punishment um, across generations, right? And so um, I, there's a little bit of research in this area, um, but I really wanted to see more so at the higher education level, how multi-generational punishment impacts students in mixed status families, um, whereas the research that we have now is more so in K-12. So, um, and I also wanted to focus solely on education. There is a lot of research that focuses on the mental health, uh, which is very important and that we should definitely be talking about as well. But um, for my particular study, I did focus on the education field. And then for Latinx studies, um, there's been a history in Latinx in the Latinx studies field of thinking about the ways that um, students, Latino, Latina, Latinx students challenge the status quo and resist the status quo and force themselves into spaces that are not meant for them, that have excluded them for throughout history. And so my study in, in many ways um, shares the stories of students that are also doing that. Um, but also contributes in thinking about how, how um, you know, the history of institutions have been racist. And so those of us that are in higher education spaces, how can we mm, be change makers, right? And, and make sure that we are changing these spaces so that we are being more inclusive of um, historically marginalized populations. Okay, um, for my positionality, usually here I do include a collage of photos of my family and um, my background, where I come from, um, but because I know this is a very, um, you know, has a very wide audience, I opted to kind of take that collage out, but I do want to share that um, one of the big reasons why I decided to pursue this study is because um, it comes from a very personal place, and I remember um, and it's very hard always to get through these presentations without crying. It was very a very emo it's a very emotional um, to share these these uh, stories with you because I can relate to them so much. But um, really, that was that was one of the reasons why I decided to pursue this uh, dissertation topic was because I remember in K twelve when when topics of immigration would come up. Um, how hard that was and um, just how much I would shake and <laughs> you know it was it was really hard and so um, I feel like those stories a lot of times are left untold um, because they have to be right we have to make sure that we keep our families safe um, and so that was one of the biggest reasons why I felt like maybe this could be a platform where I could share their, those stories um, in a confidential way and and I could let people know about these stories right 
Um, so that was a big reason why I decided to pursue the study again is because of my positionality and, and um, because this topic comes from a very personal place. For my um, literature review, um, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, one of the biggest things that um, comes up in the literature is this idea of multi-generational punishment, right? So the idea that US laws are meant to punish um, you undocumented that are meant to punish undocumented individuals also generationally punish the children their u.s citizen children and so for example when it comes to fear of deportation and or family separation there are u.s laws that create this fear right um, among undocumented immigrants um, but when you are a child of a an undocumented immigrant you also fear that deportation right you're also afraid um, of that family separation and so that's where the idea of multi-generational punishment comes in, right? Where um, you are also punishing people who are US citizens, right? Um, the inability to travel, right? US laws do not allow undocumented immigrants to travel outside of the US. Well, if you are the child of an undocumented immigrant, you likely will not be able to travel as well, right? Because a lot of times there is this dependence on your, especially when up to, you know, 18 or, or, or um until you're a young adolescent, you really depend on your on your parents for financial reasons, you know, to travel. And so if your parents are not able to do that because of U.S. laws, then you are also in, unable to travel as well uh, in many ways. Um, also, we see multi-generational punishment with limited employment opportunities, right? We see um, more and more institutions using the E-Verify these days, right, which um, really, really puts a stop to, um, you know, those workplaces giving any type of work opportunity to undocumented immigrants. And that can also lead a lot of times to economic hardships, right? Um, and then as far as limited access to social services, a lot of times undocumented immigrants um, or parents do not realize that even though maybe they don't qualify for health care, their children, who may be U.S. citizens, um, actually do qualify for health care. And so a lot of times there's some research that shows that it's hard for undocumented parents to feel safe or comfortable asking those questions about whether their children do have access to those social, social services. Um, and of course, these all of this, um, all of these uh, ways in which we've seen multi-generational punishment happen definitely impacts, um, there's a lot of research that talks about how it impacts negatively the mental health of not just undocumented uh, immigrants, but also their children uh, who may be U.S. citizens or who may be U.S. residents. Also, there's a little bit of research that talks about the academic impact that this has on um, students. So we see a little bit of research that shows that um, students who have at least one undocumented parent tend to score lower on tests and or um, have lower aspirations um, in going into college than their um, peers who maybe have parents who are US citizens. Um, I will say there are some studies that actually negate that second point saying that actually because some uh, because students have undocumented parents, they um, actually use that as a motivator and a reason why they feel like they need to have higher aspirations. So there's a little bit on both sides there. And then, uh, of course, we do see a lot of this is, can also have a big impact on um, students feeling like they really have to engage in activist efforts to make sure that they are pursuing social justice for their families. Um, that's also a big part of the research that we see um, in when it comes to uh, students who have undocumented parents or students who are in mixed status families. So thinking about my own dissertation, um, these were the two research questions that I had in mind that I really wanted to pursue um, as I interviewed folks and, and facilitated my study. And so the first research question was, um, I wanted to know how do Latinx college students in mixed status families understand their academic experiences, expectations, and aspirations? So really wanted to understand what their schooling experiences have been like. And then for the second research question, I wanted to think a little bit about policy uh, and, and so national, state, and in institutional immigration policies. How have those impacted Latinx college students in mixed status families as they pursue a higher education? 
Um, and so these were the two research questions that I um, came up with for my dissertation and I will share findings in a little bit, but first I wanna share a little bit about the methods and methodological framework that I used. Um, for my theoretical framework, the three theories that I used were um, critical race theory, black crit, and Habermas's theory of communicative action for my methodology. And so these theories aligned with each other really, really well because they are all oriented towards social justice, which was really kind of the pinnacle of my entire dissertation was, was oriented towards social justice. So it, they aligned really, really nicely with each other and with the topic of my dissertation. Um, and so thinking about critical race theory and lat crit, um, you know, I often was thinking about, okay, how are higher in education institutions working in a way to exclude the students that I am interviewing for this study, right? Students who have undocumented parents or who grew up with undocumented parents. And so thinking about the history of higher education institutions, how they have been historically racist, patriarchal, hierarchical, um, and have excluded students of color I think that was um, something that I was continuously going back to um, when I was thinking about the stories of these students and how hard it was for them to get into higher education spaces, right? But also um, highlighting their stories, right? The counter storytelling of critical race theory and lat crit really shined, I think, um, with stories that, that students shared. And that also tied into Habermas's theory of communicative action because um, I knew I wanted to do interviews for my study. And one of the biggest things that I kept thinking about as I was doing interviews was um, how important it was for me to make sure that I was had already built trust and rapport with students before doing the interview. Um, and I feel like, you know, I did reach out to a lot of folks who I already had that trust and rapport with. Um, to see if maybe they might be interested in participating. And so it was really important for me to make sure that I was being intentional about um, really trying to understand their stories. Even though I have my own positionality in this topic, I didn't want to impose my own experiences on them, really wanted to hear them out and what was coming out of their stories was really important to me. And that's a big part of Habermas's theory of communicative action is making sure that we are communicative acts are oriented toward understanding, right? And so that was a big part of the way that I approached my interviews. Um, and I think that's why students felt so comfortable sharing their authentic stories with me, which I'll share with you all in a second. Um, but that was, uh, I think all of these theories combined really helped um, make this dissertation so powerful and uplift those stories of the students that I was able to um, capture their stories. Okay, um, for my methods, so I received IRB approval to do um, this study. I did use a snowball sampling technique. So something that was really, really important to me was making sure that students did not feel um, like outed in, in that, um, you know, their parents are undocumented. And so one of the ways that I approached recruitment was, you know, I would reach out to friends who had or, um, or contacts who had mentioned to me that they already had already mentioned to me that they had undocumented parents and then if they decided to participate um, then I would ask um, if they could please just let other people know about my study and then if those other people wanted to reach out they were interested in participating then they could um, so that was one way that I tried to make sure that um, all of these stories were confidential and that people didn't feel pressured to participate um, and so that, that again, was something that was really important to me. Um, I did conduct Zoom interviews. It was in the middle of the pandemic. So um, they were Zoom interviews. Uh, students used their own, they got to choose their own pseudonym. So I don't use any real names. Um, or sometimes, you know, they just said that I could choose. So I um, chose a few of them. But uh, for the most part, participants did choose their, their names that they wanted to be referred to as in this study. I was able to interview 16 participants. And I did do two interviews, two one hour interviews with each of these participants, well, 15 participants. There was one participant that only did the first um, interview. And so the first interview that I did with participants was really focusing on their family life, their background, their, um, yeah, their, their home lives. And then the second interview really focused on their schooling experiences in K-12, uh, but mostly higher education experiences. 
And so, um, like I said, 15 of my participants engaged in both of those interviews. There was one participant that um, after their first interview decided not to move forward with the second one. Um, and so that gave me an interview, an interview, a total of 31 interviews. And then for my data analysis, I was able, I transcribed about half of my interviews, um, but I was also able to um, secure a fellowship that allowed me to um, use, purchase automated transcription services for about the second half of my interviews. And then um, the analyses that I engaged in were reconstructive horizon analysis, analyses, care analyses, power analyses, and I also used a lot of meaning fields in my coding. Um, and then out of all of these analyses, I came up with themes um, to share with you all today. Um, before I do share some of those findings, I do, I always like to preface by saying that these are the headlines that uh, were in the news throughout the time that I was working on my dissertation, right? So drawings by children who were held in border facilities, show them in cages. Uh, World expresses outrage at Trump policy on separating migrant families, right? All of these um, news stories were coming up and it just felt like one day after the other as I was working on my dissertation. And so, you know, it definitely was having an emotional toll on me as I, as I was writing my dissertation, but also I was very hyper aware of the fact that um, the students who decided to participate in my study were also, you know, in this world, seeing this anti-immigrant rhetoric very much heightened during the Trump presidency, right? And so um, I think it's always really important to, to, to preface saying that these are the stories that we were listening to as, as I was doing interviews and I was working on my dissertation. And so I um, definitely had a big impact on the way that we... Um, my participants and I were viewing the world and were viewing this study and answering and how we were, how I think my participants were answering the questions um, for this study. Um, and then a little bit of background information about my participants. Like I said, 16 students, they were all first generation college students and had attended or were attending four year institutions. Um, and then there were four, students that were undergraduates at the time of the interviews and about 12 that had already received their bachelor's between the years 2010 and 2020. Um, three of the students that I interviewed were in graduate school at the time of their interview and one was in law school. And then um, when asked about gender, 13 identified as females and three identified as males. Um, at the very end of this presenta presentation, I talk a little bit about how um, I do hope to continue this study to get a little bit more representation there. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's important to think about intersectional identities. And so, um, you know, wasn't able to get a lot of um, males who wanted to participate, but, you know, hopefully this study will continue. Um, and then majors varied anywhere between elementary education, engineering, English, social work. They were so many different majors represented, which I was very happy about. Um, and then the ethnic identities um, that students chose to identify as included Latina, Latino, Mexican, Mexican-American, and Hispanic. And again, this was an open-ended question. So this is the way that they identified when asked um, how they uh, identify in respect to race or ethnicity. And last but not least, most of my participants, 10 of them, were U.S. born with undocumented parents, and five were parents who had, U were U.S. citizen children who had parents who had U.S. residency, and there was one DACA student who really wanted to participate in this study, and I'll share her story at the very end. Um, but for the first part of my findings, I will focus only on um, the U.S. born children with undocumented parents. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about parent, those who had parents with residency and then the DACA student. So just wanna remind you of that first research question before I dive into my findings. And I do wanna keep track of time as well. Oh, good, okay. Um, so my first research question again was, how do Latinx college students in mixed status families understand their academic experiences, expectations, and aspirations? And so these were the themes that I garnered from this research question. The first theme is that um, students felt like they had to protect their undocumented parents and siblings at all costs, whether that was an emotional and physical cost, a financial cost, an aspirational cost, 
or this cost of time, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then we'll kind of go through each theme. So uh, for the first one, like I said, students felt like they had to protect their undocumented parents or siblings at all costs. And so one example uh, of an emotional or physical cost that that one that, for example, Vanessa took on um, is that she talks about how in the sixth grade, um, she remembers her teacher talking about how undocumented immigrants don't pay taxes. And she says, uh, well, I'm pretty sure they do. Um, and, and, and she talks about how um, this teacher kept talking about how undocumented immigrants weren't contributing, but she kept thinking in her in her sixth grade mind, she was like, that's not right. I know that's not right. Um, you know, and then talks a little bit later in her interview about how she has seen her parents do their taxes. So she knows they're not right. Um, and, but you know, he called them aliens and all that stuff that you hear just from ignorant, uninformed people, I guess, like they're not people, you know? And she talks about how the courage that it took for her to, she really felt like she had to say something. Um, and so in that moment, she, she talks about how um, it was really hard for her in the moment to say something right, but how she goes home and tells her sister who at the time wasn't documented. And her sister says, no, that's wrong. Like, give him this paper and tell him he's wrong. His, her sister had written up a whole, you know, done a lot of research on how undocumented immigrants do pay taxes, wrote a whole letter and, and told her, told Vanessa to please take it to her teacher so that he would know that undocumented immigrants do pay taxes, that he was wrong. Um, and Vanessa, and, and um, well, I'll share that a little bit later, but Vanessa, you know, she did it. And she talks about how she was 12 years old um, and, she felt like she had this big sense of responsibility because her sister who wasn't there was like, I'm going to give this to you and you're going to tell him and she's undocumented. So it felt like an even bigger responsibility. I had to do this. I don't think I would have done it if she wouldn't have told me to do it. I remember I was like, my knees were like shaking. I was so nervous and I was like, oh my God, I hate this. I hate that I have to do this, but I have to do this. Right. And so um, and this is the part where I usually start crying. <laughs> um, you know, Vanessa talks about that emotional toll that it took on her to stand up for her, for her, for her siblings and her parents, right? Like she really didn't want to do that, but just felt like she really needed to, to, um, so that her teacher understood that these, that her, that undocumented immigrants do pay taxes, right? Among many other contributions that they make. Um, one of the things that I like to highlight here too is um, the physical toll that um, these stories and these experiences have taken on students. She talks about, you know, my knees were like shaking. This is something that comes up in a lot of the interviews um, where students, when, when topics of immigration would come up in class or, um, you know, they were talking to someone about immigration status, they, it, they often talk about how they were shaking or one student talks about how um, his heart was beating um, as they were talking about immigration. And so you see this physical toll, even though um, they don't, students don't, you know, explicitly name it. It was something that I noticed. And even with the interviews, you know, there was a lot of times in every single interview, we cried together. And um, there was a lot of um, pauses and a lot of deep breaths right, and a lot of sniffles. And, and even that, you know, just really gave me the sense of the heaviness of this topic for students and how um, that can have a really big um, physical toll on students, right? And so, um, yeah, this is one, one story that I like to share that among the many that um, kind of talks about that emotional and physical toll that um, students had in their K through 12 schooling, but also in higher ed. Um, the second sub theme of protecting undocumented parents at all costs was the financial uh, aspect. So Natalia talks about, I'll share the quote and then I'll talk a little bit about it. She says, the first time I did FAFSA, <clears throat> oh, and well, the first time I did FAFSA verification, my parents, dad had to go to the IRS place. And like, my mom was so worried, like, oh, there's a magician there, like, no, don't go. And it was kind of scary. I didn't want anything to happen to them because of me. And even though they do their taxes, like, I guess the possibility of immigration being there, I don't know if it's true or not, but yeah, there was a year where I just didn't, I didn't do any, I didn't file for FAFSA because they had to go to the IRS office again. So I just paid. Um, so here, Natalia talks a little bit about how, um, right, the, she she didn't want to put her 
parents in a place that they deemed dangerous for them, right? And so she just took on that financial cost um, in order to, to protect her parents from that, right? Um, so this is one example of how students would protect their um, undocumented parents or siblings at all costs. Um, another example here that I saw um, a few times was um, at this time when I was doing interviews, um, stimulus checks were being given out for the because of the pandemic. And um, you know, some students talked about how they gave that stimulus check to their parents um, because they felt like their parents needed it more than they did. And so um, that was another one, one of the other ways that I saw that financial cost. Um, but there, there were other financial costs that students took on as well, which I think in another example, you'll see a little glimpse of that as well. Um, the third one that came up, and this was one that I wasn't anticipating that I didn't, you know, hadn't thought about, but hadn't read in the literature before um, I did these interviews was the aspirational cost that this took, that this experience took on students. A lot of students talked about, um, a very shared very similar stories to Vanessa here. So let me share it with you. Uh, Vanessa said, well, I had always wanted to go into editing and publishing and do writing on the side. And that was something that seemed really attainable to me. And I was like, I know you had a responsibility to your family. Like that was the Mexican part of me. And the American part of me really wanted to do publishing, right? And that's not what ended up happening. I think because not, yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe because the undocumented part of it, because I thought that, and then takes a deep breath. I thought that they needed me here. And then I asked her, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Why do you feel like they needed you? And she says, because they did, they did. All of my siblings, it felt like all of my siblings had abandoned them. They were always talking about how much they like needed me. So I felt a responsibility to come back and help them. And I did, that's what happened. And then I asked, do you feel like you've helped them? She says, yeah, financially, mentally, emotionally, you take on a big burden, I think. And so a lot of students talked about how they wanted to go to a different part of the country. They wanted to explore different career opportunities. Um, but at the end of the day, they felt like they needed, to, they needed to stay close to home in case anything bad were to happen, uh, in case their parents were to be deported, right? That they could be there to support them. Um, and so that's another one of the ways, right? That we see that cost is that aspirational cost. Students wanting to, to you know, pursue certain careers, but feeling like they had to stay close to home, which oftentimes meant that they had to alter their career choices. Okay. And then protecting undocumented parents, siblings at all costs. Uh, for, for Camila, she shares, and this was something that a lot of students shared was all of the time that they took into pursuing um, scholarships or she, Camila specifically, she talks about how um, okay, she said, okay, I really need to step up my game and I need to start, you know, like working and, you know, doing really good in school. So I was like, these classes are free right now. So I need to take them because later on, they're going to be really expensive. So it was mainly a financial reason, you know, like looking ahead. And so she was talking about how in high school um, in the state that she was in, you can get college credit. You can go to the community college nearby or even for your university and get some college credit. And so she talks about how she spent a lot of time taking advantage of those kind of opportunities and looking for those kind of opportunities because she knew that her parents were not going to be able to financially support her going into college. And so she really took on that cost of time, right, making sure that she was seeking out these opportunities, writing all of those scholarship um, applications so that she could pursue college. Okay, for my second theme, for my first research question, remember my first research question was, I wanted to understand what the academic experiences of students in mixed status families were. Um, David highlights one of the biggest things that a lot of students talked about. And this wasn't even a question that I, pro that I asked about, but all of the students talked about FAFSA and what a big barrier FAFSA is, a uh, bureaucratic hurdle for students who have undocumented parents. Um, so that be that I'll share his story. He says, um, but then I did a college access program and I had to get verified for my parents' tax verification process from FAFSA. 
and no one could help me. Like I would go to the student building and I would say, I don't know what to do. How do I get this verified? And they're basically just like, well, we just need your parents' social security number. And I was like, well, they don't have one, but they still file taxes. So I remember just bawling because I looked at an estimate of what college would be if they did take away my refund. And like, I was just a hot mess. So I went and confided in some friends and they basically just told me to suck it up and take out loans. And that made me feel even worse. And so David and a lot of students talk about how, um, you know, they had to get FAFSA verified um, and, and didn't know what to do when asked about their parents' social security numbers on the FAFSA form, right? And so they would go around asking everyone on campus, all the different student service offices, you know, he, David talks about how the second year he went to the Latino Cultural Center. Um, and there was never anyone that could help them. It was, they would have to jump from one office, one person to another um, before they finally found someone who could help them. And so I'll talk a little bit about how um, this is really important to think about in when we think about educational policies and making sure that all of our staff are aware of ways that we can support students in mixed status families. Um, but this was one big experience was just having to figure out how to navigate this FAFSA verification process um, on their own. Um, David talks about, like I said, how he went, He the second year he was like, okay, let me do this right with someone. So he went to the Latino Cultural Center and um, he said, but the person who was there helping me at the Latino Cultural Center, who was supposedly very knowledgeable and like could help, I told him my parents didn't have a social security like neither of them. And he went like, that's impossible. Like how do they file taxes then? They need to have a social. So at that moment, I was just like, okay, thank you, and just walked away and left. He knew that this person would not be able to help him. Um, again, it, even though it was he had already been through it the first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, he talks about how it was the same thing, and it was just such a nightmare. There were a few students who used that actual word. It was a nightmare, FAFSA so was a nightmare. Um, and again, so I'll talk a little bit about what this means for policy um, a little bit later. And I know now FAFSA processes are really just not helpful at all for students who have undocumented parents. They are going, coming across all kinds of issues. Um, so that's something that is, if there are any higher ed or K through 12 um, folks here that we really need to think about making sure that we um, figure this out for our students and that we support them as much as possible in getting their FAFSAs, um, um, applying for their FAFSAs. And then I did wanna provide a quick counter example here of Natalia who talks about how she in a counter example of how easy it was for her to get her FAFSA question answered. She talks about how um, she was worried about FAFSA, worrying about how like if she would qualify because her parents were undocumented. And um, she says um, she she goes and talks to her counselor. And I ask her, do you remember how the counselor responded to that? And she said, oh, yeah, it's OK. You could just put zero, zero, zero. Like, that's it. That's all you have to do. Just put zero, zero, zero. Right. This is how easy it could have been for David, right? If someone would have been knowledgeable about that, um, to just put zero, zero, zeros and submit the application like that. So I always like to give this quick counter example to show how easy it could have been for folks to um, answer that question for our stu these student participants. And then um, let's see, just getting a little short on time here. So. Um, I'll share a little bit about themes three and four, and then I do want to share some themes for U.S. residency and some policy recommendations. Um, so I feel like I'm going to go a little quicker now, so I apologize for that, <laughs> but um, do want to share that um, the importance of support systems and also um, for theme four, self-advocacy. Those were two big themes that also came up when thinking about um, how students navigate their higher education experiences, right? So Beatriz, she shares a story about her eighth grade history teacher um, who has been a lifelong mentor for her. And um, Beatriz actually got accepted to a college out of state, and um, but her mom was afraid to fly with her because she was undocumented. And so Beatriz, you know, felt like she didn't, she, she felt like, you know, okay, maybe I can't go to this out of state college because, you know, I, I won't have anyone to help take me there, right? Um, but then she talks about her eighth grade history teacher who who she mentioned this to and who said, oh, I'll go with you, you know, I'll fly with you. I'll take two suitcases for you and I'll help you move and I'll help you take and I'll help take you from the airport to the school. Right. And Beatrice talks about how meaningful this was for her, this support system. Right. 
Um, other students share support. There were different ways that we saw support systems um, come up in the interviews. And so one of the ways that that I saw that was through um, also just families saying like, you can do it, echale ganas, you know, even just that was a big source of support for a lot of the student participants in this study. Um, and like I said, self-advocacy, you know, like David, Salvador also talks about, you know, I, I knew that I had to go around around figuring it out by myself, not knowing who was really going to be able to ask, but just knew that they had to continue advocating for themselves um, if they wanted to navigate these higher ed spaces. Okay, let's, uh, so a little bit about research question two, man, time is not on my side right now, but um, how have national institutional and immigrant and institutional immigration policies impacted Latinx college students and mixed status families as they pursue a higher education. Um, so I came up with three themes for this. I wanted to talk about the first two, so I'll share them quickly here. Um, how fear of deportation for parents impacts schooling experiences. Um, Camila was one story that um, just was a heartbreaking story about how um, her father was deported when she was in in high school um and um but so she talks about that anxiety and the fear and the worry it just like it never goes away because I'm always so scared and I'm always like dad you know like I moved out but I'm always like dad be careful drive safely call me if you need anything right um so Camila talks about how this fear of deportation is something that she just continuously has um has always had but especially after her dad was deported um, and she talks about how um, she got a scholarship to go to a nearby college and she said, this is where I'm going. There's no other choices. She really felt like she had no other choice. Um, she said that she got accepted to a public four-year university away from home, but it wasn't going to give her a full scholarship. So she said, I'm not going there. And I remember friend, two of her friends saying that they were going to go to a public four-year university away from home. And they were so excited, you know, and I was like, oh, they're so lucky. They get to live in a dorm. They get to do all this fun stuff. And I was like, I have to stay close to home. I can't leave. I was still scared for anything bad to happen, you know. And so this fear of deportation really impacted the choice of where she decided to go for college, right? Making sure that she was staying close to home again in case anything would happen in case um, they had to go through this again. Um, she also talks about how having younger siblings and how if her parents were to be deported, she knew that she had to take on taking care of her siblings. Um, so again, this is one of the ways that um, stu students in mixed status families, um, how their um, schooling experiences were impacted by that experience. And then another one that came up again, this wasn't a question that I didn't have any questions about Trump, but they came up, he came up in every interview um, because there was this very much heightened anxiety around his presidency, right? And so Mario talks about an experience he had on campus, on his college campus. He says, um, one particular experience that I had was my freshman year here. There was a group of students who decided to basically build a little prop and it was a wall and tagged on it was build that wall. And, you know, walking by that your freshman year, you know, you want to be welcomed. You want to fit into this campus life. And seeing that your first year really brings you back to reality and motivates you, you know, like this is the reason why you're doing this. You're doing this for your family. And that experience will probably stick with me. And I'll always think about that. Again, there was this, this and this is something that happened, um, you know, across a lot of different universities in, in the U.S. when Trump was announcing his presidency and when he was in presidency. And Mario talks about how that had a really big negative impact on him and how he didn't feel a sense of belonging on his campus, especially his freshman year seeing that. Right. And um, he talks about how, you know, students have to go through a process to have these kind of, you know, props or these kind of um showings on campus and Mario felt like the administration had really failed students and mixed status families or undocumented or DACA students because they allowed this to happen right and so um, he talks about how he, he engaged in some protests after that um, some of the student organizations on campus had had organized um, because this was something that really he felt was not okay as part of his um, college experience right um, let's move on to um, academic experiences of Latinx students with U.S. resident parents. Um, I think the biggest thing I wanted to highlight here is that um, 
students who had U.S. resident parents, again, the students that I interviewed for this study, they got to see that transition from their, their parents being undocumented to then being U.S. residents. Um, and so a lot of them talk about realizing the privileges that come with residency, feeling a little bit safer, feel, knowing, um, you know, that once they have residency for a certain number of years, then they can apply for U.S. citizenship and they can vote, right, um, after they get U.S. citizenship. And so they they really acknowledged that they realized that their life was much different when their parents were able to get U.S. residency. Um, another thing that came up was, um, and, and this is the example that I'll share with you just for sake of time. Um, this is the one that I'll focus on. But I noticed there were a lot of parallels between the different experiences of students in mixed status families. Um, so there, there was definitely a lot of differences, um, but also there were these parallels that came up. And so I'll, let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, so Rita, she, let me share her, her, her story with you. She talks about how her mom immigrated. It took her 12 years in order to be able to get her residency to go back. And so I think of that time that she wasn't able to see her mom. And, and I think about the relationships they lost and the conversations that weren't made and birthdays and celebrations that just didn't happen. And so when I think of the relationship my mom and her mom had, like they had an okay relationship, but over time my grandma started to forget about my mom and she started to only remember her daughter that lived with her. And so when my grandma started to pass, which was this past year, it was really sad to kind of see that kind of loss because it's not that my grandma didn't love my mom. It was just that she didn't have that close relationship. And so um, Rita talks about this loss of time, right? These loss of relationships, these loss of connections between her mother and her grandmother. Um, Elena and, and Rita was, um, her mom was a US residency at the time, a US resident at the time of her interview. Elena, um, when I interviewed her, her mom had literally just gotten US residency um, like a few months back. And Elena talks about how, you know, her mom got to go for the first time. And it was such an emotional trip because her mom had died in those 30 years, her brother had died. Um, so she didn't get to see them at their funeral like she hadn't seen them since she had left and she was like in her early 20s so her memory of her parents is when she was younger obviously she talked to them over the phone but she hadn't see her, seen her family in so long and then to lose them and not be able to visit them or go to their funeral I know she was depressed for a while because of that so it sucked to see her go through that so yeah no when she visited it, sh she was like it was just a trip for closure like closure um, right. These stories came up very often where, um, you know, their parents, students, parents had lost a family member in Mexico or in their home country and they weren't able to go to their funeral. Right. And so, again, all of that time um, lost building those relationships um, you see with all of these student participants, whether their parents were U.S. citizens or U.S. residents. Um, Vanessa, whose parents were undocumented also talks about the sense of loss. And she talks about deportation as a sense of loss, right? That fear of deportation, she says. Um, and I guess that's what brings me back, right? Is that fear? Because I think a lot about like, okay, what if something happens? Because I think deportation feels like a kind of death where you leave and you don't come back. That's what it's like, um, a little bit like dying. So I've always been, um, you know, was trying to take deep breaths. I'm hanging on to that fear. So this sense of loss, you really feel it with, you know, all of these student participants, whether their students were U.S. residents or U.S. Um, citizens. And so that was something that I think um, I wasn't I, I wasn't expecting to find, but something that was really, really interesting when I was able to um, look at all of these interviews um, alongside each other. Um, OK, for sake of time, I think I will jump to um, some policy implications. Uh, just want to quickly note that um, I came up with four main policy implications based on these student stories. And so the first one was college access and retention programs. All of the students talked about the importance of programs like Gear Up, like Upward Bound, um, Indiana. Some of the students were in Indiana. So Indiana 21st Century Scholars um, program, right, that provides tuition for first generation low income students to go to college. So all of these were really, really helped facilitate students in accessing higher education. Um, so the importance of these is one of the biggest policy implications that I include in my dissertation. Um, also thinking back to David and Salvador's story, 
making sure that our campus resource centers um, has knowledgeable staff, right? And just across the institution that we have staff that are knowledgeable and that know how to support students in mixed status families, undocum undocumented students and DACA students. Um, making sure that we have culturally responsive teachers and faculty in K-12 and higher education, right? This goes back um, to um, thinking about that story with Vanessa where she felt like she had to tell her sixth grade teacher, she had she felt like she had to educate her sixth grade teacher about um, whether immigrants pay taxes or not, right? Making sure that we are engaging in culturally responsive teaching uh, is one of the biggest ways that I think we can also facilitate these discussions in, in classrooms that are, um, you know, don't feel like um, we are hurting our, our students in mixed status families, right? And last but not least, decolonizing higher education spaces, hiring more faculty of color, faculty um, access to culturally responsive and affordable mental health services, right? Um, all of these students, you, you see that emotional toll that this experience has taken on them. And so mental health services is something that is really important that needs to be accessible on college campuses um, and institutionalizing support systems for students and mixed status families. Um, and then just some ideas for future research. Um, I really want to, you know, some of the students talked about how Latinx Ch Ch Chicanx studies classes were kind of safe spaces for them on campus where they felt like they could talk about immigration in a way that was, you know, felt they could freely open up about that and they felt safe opening up about that or they felt safe talking about it. Um, so I would like to explore this a little bit further. I think this would be really important to explore. Um, the gendered differences of experiences in mixed status families. Again, that's another one that I really want to explore further. Um, all of the stories that I included in my dissertation, um, the students were already in higher ed or they had graduated already. And so one thing I would like to expand on is thinking about how, um, making sure that I include the stories of students who maybe weren't able to enroll in a higher education institution. Um, I know that sometimes, especially even when we think about the FAFSA, right? Like students that may not know or before that you could put zeros on the FAFSA, maybe they, you know, they, at that moment they say, okay, well, maybe if I need my parents' social security number, maybe I can't go to college, right? So um, I think that there's a lot of barriers that students take, try to have to jump over in order to get to higher ed. And so thinking about those students that maybe, um, you know, higher ed failed them, I think would be um, important stories to share. And then last but not least, including the stories of students and mixed status families who do not identify as Latinx. So I know a lot of times when we talk about immigration, you know, we think about Latinx families, but of course there are families from other races, ethnicities um, that also ex have this experience. And so expanding a little bit more on that, I think would be uh, really, really important. Um, and then just to come full circle, um, when I, I, this was one of the questions that I asked in, in, in my interview, what, what do you wish faculty and administrators knew about students in mixed status families? And this is a specific quote from a student. I wish they knew we existed. Um, and so the, in some way, shape, shape or form, all students said this, I wish they knew that we existed. And so for those of us that are in K-12 or higher ed, um, just kind of wanted to end with this to make sure that we are always being mindful of our mixed students and mixed status families, DACA students and documented students in our classrooms and beyond. Okay. And I will end with that. I, I do have, um, you know, it's always hard to share this without giving my acknowledgements. So I'll just put, post them there. There were a lot of people that helped support my dissertation even by telling me, you know, along the way, echale ganas. Um, so I always like to make sure that I acknowledge these folks. Um, but with that, I would love to open it up for questions. If anyone has any questions, um, I would love to hear them. I think we have one question in the Q and A. Yeah. It's from Dr. Vanessa Martinez asking the participants who identified as Latina, Latino, or Hispanic. Were they also Mexican or Mexican American, or were they Central or South American? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, they were all of the students except for one was Mexican American. There was one student that was um, identified as Mexican and Guatemalan, um, but all of the students, other than that one student, did identify as either Mexican or Mexican American. Yeah, that's a really good question. 
And that's another opportunity to expand, right? Thinking more so about Central Americans um, and their experiences, which which also are, are probably different in some ways, right? Thank you for that question, Dr. Hunter. And if anyone would like me to send you an invitation to speak, if you'd rather say your question, then type it, uh, just raise your hand, or you can send me a message in the chat. And if no one has any more questions, I mean, this is the time to ask Dr. Nunez if you have anything. This is the time. <laughs> no, I also didn't leave a ton of time for questions, so. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Nunez, for taking the time to meet with us today. We greatly appreciate you um, and the work that you're doing. And congratulations again on, on your paper's recognition for Ahi's Outstanding Dissertation Competition. Thank you, thank you so much, Kayla. Thank you to Ahi and ETS. Thank you to everyone who came today. I appreciate you all so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Nunez. Thank you everyone for attending. Bye-bye. You all have a good afternoon. All right, I'll go ahead and end it, but thank you so much for, for attending, so. Or for being here today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Kayla. <laughs> okay. You take Bye. care. You too. Bye.